Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of ENDO 2018, the Endocrine Society's 100th Annual Meeting and Expo. I'm Jenny Glenn Gingery from the Endocrine Society. I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations here. We hope you've been enjoying your experience at the annual meeting here in Chicago. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the top abstracts being presented here on obesity. We're very pleased to have with us Margaret Stifeder, a fellow at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts, and Christian Roth, Professor of Pediatrics at the Seattle Children's Research Institute in Washington. So over the next 20 minutes or so, each speaker will be sharing their findings. We will have one Q&A session at the end of today's presentations. Please note that this web conference is being broadcast live via webcast and that there are many journalists online with us right now. Because we're broadcasting via the web, it's really important that all remarks be made into the microphones so that those who are joining us virtually can hear what is being said in the room. Um, for the journalists who are attending online, when we get to the Q&A period at the end, we'll just ask that you type your questions into the chat function. Um, and now I would like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Stifatter, to join us. Good morning. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present our work today or to share our to share our work with you guys. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our um, study, which was basically um, designed to try to understand how ruin why gastric bypass surgery elicits its beneficial effects. Um, so um, just to give you sort of a, a lay of the land here, I've included the normal gastrointestinal anatomy on the left. So you can see up at the top is the um, esophagus leading into the stomach, and then that leads into the small intestine. And um, just to to um, give you an overview of what ruin, gastric, ruin why gastric bypass surgery involves, basically um, uh, it involves the creation of a small gastric or stomach pouch that's then connected to a more distal piece of intestine, so a piece of intestine that was a lot further down. And, um, and then most of the stomach and the more proximal part of the intestine is bypassed from the flow of nutrients. Um, and this is actually a surgical technique that's been around for more than 100 years and was only um, adapted in the 1960s as a weight loss surgery. And you can see why it's called Ruin Y because the new anatomy sort of looks like a Y. Um, and this was first done by a guy named Rue. So um, you may know um, that uh, bariatric surgery, including Ruin Y gastric bypass surgery, is really highly effective to elicit long term weight loss. And it's unique in this regard. This, these surgeries are much more um, effective than diet, diet and exercise alone, even, even with medications. Um, and, and furthermore, uh, ruin y is very um, effect, an effective treatment for type 2 diabetes, which you may know is a common obesity-related comorbidity or obesity-associated problem. Um, and of course, type 2 diabetes is a problem of deranged glucose metabolism. Um, Ruin Y can lead to diabetes remission in up to 80% of patients. Um, this is really very remarkable. Um, it's actually the effect is immediate in many patients. And so for this reason, we're starting to think about Ruin Y not just as a weight loss surgery, but actually as a metabolic surgery as well and as a diabetes therapy. And so um, we are interested in sort of reverse engineering um, this surgery in order to think about how to create better uh, therapies for uh, obese patients um, who may have diabetes. And we're interested in the intestine. The intestine is the organ that's manipulated in the surgery, but um, additionally, it's increasingly recognized as a really important metabolic organ. It has a high metabolic demand because it's constantly turning, the uh, intestinal mucosa is con constantly turning over, and this costs a lot of energy. Um, our uh, lab has previously demonstrated in our animal models, so in rats and mice, that um, uh, Ruin Y enhances intestinal energy utilization, and particularly for glucose. Um, specifically, we see proliferation and remodeling in the intestine, um, and in, uh, the intestine uh, becomes thicker, longer, bigger, and beefier. And we can see um, evidence of increased utilization of metabolic fuels, especially glucose, but also cholesterol and amino acids as well. And so our goal for this study was to um, ask whether these mechanisms are uh, important for clinical improvement in human patients, um, because 
these are the people we want to, to treat. Um, and so um, I'm going to tell you some key messages from our study, and then I'll kind of work backwards and um, give you some nuts and bolts of how we got there. Um, so gene expression signatures in the human intestine can actually predict con both concurrent and future improvements in um, glucose metabolism and other clinical outcomes as well, including weight loss. Um, and then uh, our data we believe highlight that the intestine may be an important therapeutic target for patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, so how did we get here? Um, we uh, designed a human study um, that was a longitudinal prospective study. This is an NIH funded registered clinical trial, which is a collaboration between our lab at Boston Children's Hospital and uh, with the University of Pittsburgh. And um, we, this is an ongoing study that um, uh, includes 32 patients, and it, the data presented in this abstract is from the first 19 patients in this study. Um, patients we're, were, um, kind of refer, referring to the picture at the top, patients were um, recruited into the study after deciding to undergo Roux Y gastric bypass surgery, and were consented to have a biopsy or piece of the intestine taken out during um, the surgery itself, so at baseline, and um, via endoscopy at one month, six months, and 12 months after uh, the operation. And our primary outcome was um, gene expression. Um, we related gene expression signatures to clinical outcomes, and this was using a technology called microarray that allowed us to look at um, tissue-specific patterns of gene expression um, in the intestine. Um, and so, indeed, what we see, the Roux Y appears to be sort of like bodybuilding for the intestine. We see uh, remodeling of the uh, intestinal tissue, um, looking at specific pathways um, that are enriched in the tissue after surgery. We see upregulation of cell cycle genes, um, other pathways that are important for tissue growth and turnover. And this appears to make the intestine hungry. Um, we see um, upregulation, or which means increased expression of genes important for fuel metabolism, specifically glucose, cholesterol, especially amino acids as well. And um, um, really the purpose of this study was to identify targets which may um, be important as therapeutic targets. And so we used our data to um, identify intestinal gene expression fingerprints, so to speak, which can um, predict clinical outcomes. And, and notably, clinical outcomes can vary a lot from patient to patient. So the idea was to relate an individual's gene expression fingerprint with their own clinical outcomes. And what we find is that the degree of clinical improvement actually does relate to um, the intestinal gene expression signatures. We find that the intestinal gene expression fingerprint is established sort of fairly early on and seems to persist out to six months, this can predict outcomes even out to a year, so markers of how much better somebody's diabetes um, is, um, including like hemoglobin A1C. And so um, we believe that after Ruin Y, uh, remodeling and growth within the intestine translates um, into increased metabolic demand of the tissue. Um, uh, sort of necessitating increased utilization of metabolic fuels. Um, you know, these two things may relate to one another. Um, this demand may also support tissue growth. Um, but I think, importantly, together, these ap appear to um, relate to glycemic improvement, among other um, clinical markers of clinical improvement as well. And um, in particular, we can um, uh, look at and relate an individual's uh, uh, gene expression fingerprint to these in order to sort of start to think about where should we look for therapeutic targets um, uh, in order to create therapies that are either um, less invasive than Roux Y gastric bypass surgery or uh, non-surgical. Uh, um, and so just to sort of um, give credit to our team here, I'd like to thank my, my mentor, um, Dr. Nicholas Dilopoulos at Boston Children's Hospital, um, our uh, collaborators at the University of Pittsburgh, especially Anita Kirkless, who um, is the surgeon who uh, performed the surgeries and all of the endoscopies for this study, um, as well as our whole team of collaborators at uh, both at Pittsburgh and at Boston Children's Hospital and our funding sources. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stevader. And now I'd like to call Dr. Roth up to the podium.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share our results. Um, we are interested to understand um, appetite regulation. And we know that appetite and food intake not only depend on motivation to eat, but also to be able to inhibit food intake. And um, before I start, I wanted to give credit to our team who did uh, the study and uh, investigated uh, the results in our patients. These are 9 to 11 year old children. And I also wanted to thank uh, the NIH for funding these studies. These uh, studies that I present are part of a larger new imaging grant where we look at functional new imaging in obese children. Now, impulsivity is, uh, the, is related to inability uh, um, to, to control and, and um, therefore it is very interesting to look at impulsivity in context of um, appetite control because it can potentially lead to uncontrolled eating and increased caloric intake. Um, Family-based behavioral uh, treatment is maybe the gold standard for treatment of obesity in young children. It is mainly delivered to parents, but also to the children, and there is a in, very intensive interaction between the interventionists, uh, parents, and children. Um, we were interested to study impulsivity in um, children before and after six months of uh, family-based behavioral treatment. And we also had um, a control group of 9 to 11 year old children. You see here the two groups, so 22 children uh, with healthy weight um, and uh, 54 children with obesity. You see here the BMI, normal for the healthy weight kids and increased for the obese kids. And we are typically looking at the BMI Z-score, which corrects for gender and age. So normal is around zero, and these are the increased BMI z-scores in the obese group. Now, the very interesting finding was that in our children with obesity, we had a much higher portion of children with high impulsivity. So we tested impulsivity by uh, some tasks. These are typically go-no-go -no -go tasks to test inhibition. And, and, and so we found that uh, in obese children um, are more likely to be impulsive. And if we compare it here to healthy weight children, here we have only 14%, whereas in obese children, 43% of high impulsivity. Um, there is no difference in impulsivity scoring between uh, uh, males and females, but um, the group of highly impulsive children was a little bit younger. Now, the very interesting result for us was to see that the change in BMI Z-score after six months of weekly interventions uh, was much stronger in, the, in children rated high in impulsivity, so they responded better to treatment. And um, here are the data for inhibition score. So the high in inhibition score is the lower degree of impulsivity. And what we saw here is after six months in obese children, we saw an increase of inhibition scores and decrease of impulsivity. And it was very interesting to see that there was a relationship between the increase of inhibition and the decrease of BMI z-score, which you can see here. So the higher the increase of inhibition score, the stronger was the reduction of BMI during the treatment. So we, we conclude that we have a higher proportion of children with obesity which are rated highly impulsive and that inhibition scores improved in children with obesity following the family-based behavioral treatment. And there was a relationship with greater change in impulsivity after treatment was related to greater reduction in BMI Z-score. 
and FPT strategies are suitable for uh, obesity intervention in obese children. So that's a good tool maybe to deliver to these uh, obese children because they responded very well to treatment. Thank you very much. Great. I'd now like to open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, remember to please wait until uh, the microphone is brought to you and speak into the microphone. And we'd appreciate it if you could identify yourself and your institution. Uh, Ed Sussman with MedPage today. For Dr. Seffler, um, it's sort of fascinating that genetic expression would change just because of surgery. Have you identified any um, genetic changes that would indicate that um, things that cause weight gain uh, have been downregulated or things that would protect against that have been upregulated? Um, do you have any specifics that you can tell us about what you've found in the genetic expression that's different and may play a role in the future? Sure. I mean, I think that that's um, a great question. We know that the intestine is, uh, is a very important, appears to be an important metabolic organ and an important organ in the normal um, regulation of energy balance. But I think we're still learning um, a lot about um, you know, in under normal circumstances, how does the intestine contribute to to uh, maintenance of normal body weight? How how might it be involved in normal weight gain and weight loss? Um, we we have done some um, closer looking at our gene expression fingerprints using um, something called enrichment analysis. We do find that um, uh, a broad array of different kinds of pathways or biological processes are altered after the surgery. You know, some of them you might expect, such as certain immune um, or inflammatory pathways um, regulated, but I think we're still looking into um, which specific processes might be most important um, for that weight loss and also glycemic improvement. Is there any, do you have any quantitative uh, figures on how many genes were changed and things like that? Yeah, um, we do. I, I, didn't include them here today, but um, we do see very um, robust gene expression within the um, uh, intestine, or, uh, within this, we're looking at a specific area of the intestine called the, the rulem, um, which is that reconfigured part of the intestine. And we see uh, uh, a very robust um, change. I don't have the specific numbers here with me today, but um, yeah. Thank you. Kari Oaks with Clinical Endocrinology News, and this is also for you. Um, maybe the question was partly answered if you're looking just at the Rue limb, but I was curious about whether you think these uh, changes in gene expression are unique to the surgical intervention or whether some very low-calorie diets that also can show speedy and robust improvements in type 2 diabetes might uh, have some of their improvements attributable to the same mechanisms? Yeah, and that's a great question. In our study, sort of every patient served as their own control because we were comparing post-operative time points to the, the uh, time of surgery, which was baseline in our study. I think it would be interesting to do some of those comparisons. Hi, this, call, this uh, question is for Dr. Steffeter. Can you tell us, um, were there any particular genes you were looking at or what the names of the genes were? Um, yeah, so again, we see um, many pathways uh, uh, altered after the surgery. In particular, some of the pathways of interest that did seem to uh, relate to, in particular, glycemic improvement after the surgery included things like amino acid metabolism within the um, intestine. We're still sort of looking into the particular genes that we think might be most important. But our statistical analysis allowed us to sort of ask which, um, which lists of genes within, you know, we were looking at 
basically all of the expressed genes within the intestine, of those, which ones were most likely to relate to uh, glycemic improvement. And once we sort of hone down, we have those lists, um, we can start to look at individual genes. But we know that amino acid metabolism appears to be important. Um, some inflammatory pathways appear to be um, important as well. Uh, P10 or any particular uh, genes, like how many genes were you looking at? Yeah, so the, um, the Affymetrix um, microarray that we're using includes about 70,000 probe sets. Of course, there's some redundancy um, here, um, but we're looking broadly at sort of all genes that are expressed within the um, intestine. It's hard to really hang our head on a particular gene at this point. Um, and I think we have a lot more work to sort of uh, to get to that point where we can say, you know, look at one particular gene as a target, but hopefully we'll get there. Hi, Ed Sussman again. Just to follow up on that, your last comments. Um, one, I'm just curious as to whether you're working with uh, any uh, industry um, people to, that may want to um, exploit what you're finding in development of uh, medications yes. rather than surgery. So um, at this point, we're not working with any um, pharmaceutical companies. I think you know, we have a little bit of work to do to really um, uh, understand exactly what's going on. We're a lot closer, and we're very excited that our findings have really um, uh, given us a lot of insight into how the intestine may um, contribute to um, improvement after we're in Y. In, in particular, it actually allows us to sort of um, quantify the, the, um, the contribution of the intestine. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope that our future studies give us even more insight into where in particular to look for therapeutic targets. Hi, Chris and Monica with MedPage Today. My question is for Dr. Roth. Um, in terms of the family-based behavioral treatment, how widely available is this, and is it usually covered by insurance? Yeah, <clears throat> we do that um, only for patients that are involved in a, a research study. Um, it is not, not covered, um, but there is an a new direction which is called, it's currently under investigation, it's a shift, um, and so the name is shift, and what, what we try to understand is if we deliver treatment to uh, parents, that they can become also interventionists in the future, so they learn, um, you know, some um, important um, um, measures to uh, deliver information to their peers and and that is something what is currently tested and I, I would expect um, so the lead is Brian Salins on this and and um, that this study will maybe show that it can be um, um, less expensive and, and uh, effective to treatment of obesity in children Uh, this question is for Dr. Roth, uh, John O'Tromke again. Um, you mentioned uh, in the paper that it says that you used uh, rewards to motivate the children uh, to control their impulsivity. What kind of rewards did you use? So we, um, we tested. So first of all, if, if they participate, they get some information about you know, how they do, and so they, they have some direct feedback, and we do that very frequently. Um, and then second, we, we test their eating also. We have something what is called healthy eating index, so we know if they are doing better, so they get directly the feedback about their eating. Um, that's pretty much it, but we, we test also um, the reward as an, as an test, and we, we can test um, a ratio between immediate and delayed reward. And that's very interesting. So in these children, actually, they go for the immediate reward. So typically, they, are, you know, they, they cannot control their rewards. They, they really want to go for an immediate reward. And that also relates to impulsivity and also to the change in BMI. Those kids who had this 
feature of more immediate reward towards delayed reward, they did actually better in this uh, family-based behavioral treatment. Can you hold on until we get the microphone? Sorry. Uh, what, what kind of reward is it? Is it a toy maybe or a game or? No, it's not a game. It's not. Um, it, it is definitely talking about their results and about, uh, you know, um, how they are doing. And uh, so that's, that's pretty much the reward. Mm. Uh, we do have a question from the webcast. This is a question for Dr. Stefader. Given the abundance of research suggesting that surgery can lead to type 2 diabetes remission, including yours, does it suggest that the treatment should start to be recommended for a wider range of patients than currently endorsed, such as those with lower BMI? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's um, a great question. Um, certainly, we see that the um, remission of diabetes after surgery is a, um, it's a well-established phenomenon, and, and we know this is occurring early. This surgery is highly effective in that regard. I think, you know, we're always, um, we have to be careful to weigh the benefits of surgery with the potential side effects, and, and certainly, um, ruin my gastric bypass is a great option for some patients, and, and we have to be, you know, potentially it's, uh, uh, not the best choice for other patients, such as patients who are very young. Um, but I, I think that um, that's an important question that I don't think anybody really has the answer to. But um, I think it's a good question. Great. Well, thank you so much to our speakers, Dr. Stupider and Roth. We're very happy to have you with us. And thank you to everyone in the audience for attending today. We hope you enjoy the rest of your experience at ENDO 2018. Mm -hmm.